in that instant, I'm looking down and there's, I'm in a different place and there's this beautiful meadow and there's a man kneeled down and he's holding my hand and he was smiling. He has the most beautiful smile and beautiful teeth, beautiful eyes. His eyes just, they're not normal. They're just like, just they're living, uh, like they're moving like blue and green. They're just amazing. But it was Jesus. And, and <laughs> I said, you're, you're that man I talk to, you know, when I am, you know, my prayers and whatever. And he goes, I am. And he was smiling and there were, the, it was a pasture. It was really pretty and green. It was like the perfect park. And then to the left, there were children playing in like a roundabout. And he said, you have to go back. I'm here today with Tamara Calder Richardson. She is a six time near death experiencer and evidential psychic medium. Uh, she is known as the Southern Bell medium. She is also a trance and conscious channeler of ascended masters, such as Jesus Christ, Mother Mary, Saints, Yogananda, Ramanjula. I'm sure I said that wrong. <laughs> Ramanuju, I think. Oh, okay, okay. Tesla, Einstein, and ultra dimensional, such as Commander Ashtar of the Galactic Federation, the Council of Light, Arcturian Syrian Council. She is a former Atlantean Syrian Supreme Priestess of Portal Technology, as well as a Celestial Hybrid. Tamara, I am so excited to have you here and to learn from you and be able to spend this time with you. Thank you so much for being my guest. Oh, are you kidding? I've been really excited about this and I'm really uh, thrilled that you had the calling from God like I did to start your channel and you're gonna do so great. So I feel really blessed and I feel together we're blessed just being here, having this conversation. And I want you on my channel too. Oh, I'd be happy to. I'd be honored to be your guest. And um, I know we have a lot to talk about today. And let's go ahead and start with your near-death experiences. Tell me about that. Well, I've had six. I can, you know, I feel like what I'd like to cover today is just kind of highlight uh, you know, briefly go over, there's so many, there's six, uh, my near death experiences, but then the really cool supernatural things that happen with each one, what I learned, how that carries through with me and life now, as well as, uh, the after effects of these near death experiences, not really being normal, how you, we affect energy. I've blown out street lights as well as turn in buildings i've turned my car on uh as well as you know, i'd like to do that again i don't know how and then my tv i don't know how i what just standing there and it was off and and we couldn't find the remote and i said i just need for it to be owned and it came on so these are the things that happen uh, people like me blow up laptops this kind of thing but I've learned to manage that. Um, and I, and it's quite easy how I, I do that. I just visualize a switch, turning it off and then being surrounded in white light. And my intention is to not screw up energy anymore <laughs> and to control it and be that energy and, and be mastery over that. But that did come out of it, including being able to speak with spirit people anywhere from goes to the ones in heaven. I don't particularly like talking to ghosts, but I do help them cross over from time to time, especially in my sleep time. I find that I do that unconsciously. And then um, also with loved ones, I'm an evidential medium. And so I was trained. I was been like this since three for my first near death experience. But then as life went on, I had this calling. I kept being called to do it. And then, so I trained eight years in the British self evidential mediumship with John Holland and certified by Lisa Williams as an advanced psychic medium. And then Tony, uh, Tony Stockwell, who's in the UK, I studied extensively eight years with him and Lisa in particular with stage mediumship, do a lot of stage stuff. And I, I think it gives people um, healing to know that this life goes on. Our loved ones are praying for us over there, which is really sweet and looking out for us. And they want our best interest because they know we're here for such a short time. They want us to go for it and live our fullest life. And that continues to be the message, you know, over and over. Heal what you need to so you can move forward in your life. So, um, so I want to start with my um, NDE 
that I had initially. I didn't even know it was uh, an ND <laughs> at first. Um, actually ran it in a regression. And I've had about 375 hours of past life and in between life. Much has not been on this planet, I have to be honest. <laughs> That'll be for part two when we talk about the Galactic Federation and our true origin of where we're from. But, um, you know, this is the thing why I think it's so important to be open to your journey, to be open to the messages that you get and uh, to question it and then, but to not have fear and to move forward with that. But um, my first one was a, um, it was considered a prenatal through um, like PMH's, PMH at Waters book, Forever Angels talks about prenatals. And I do remember being spirit my mother was pregnant and she was losing me and she was uh, I was not I wasn't really concerned about myself I'm just kind of hovering around watching her and what it looked like uh we're in the you know the bathroom I'm seeing outside so I remember being fully conscious of spirit I also remember following her and picking her out and my grandmother she lived with my grandmother really loved and my grandmother's very strong but then my mom's very funny and very girly and so I really like that. And I saw, I would watch them and follow them. And, and, uh, even told my mom, did she used to wear this pen, blah, 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 that I saw she wore that to school. Um, cause she had me pretty young. So, uh, we are spirit when I was, uh, three years old, uh, which I would, um, that was pretty substantial. That's where I was playing hide and seek this old antebellum um, house, which was, um, my uncle was married to a woman, a crew, her name was Cruz and they had this big house. And so they had a, a child and I was playing with my cousin hide and seek and they, you know, they're counting. I don't know what, what we counted to maybe 20. I don't know. And then I'm running upstairs. Maybe it was, it was more than that, but we're running upstairs. And, uh, I think she was a little bit older than me. I'm running upstairs to um, hide and find a place. And I did feel that it, there were like spirit people there. I did sense that. And, uh, but I was squealing, I was trying to find a place. And as I'm jumping, there was a dresser and I don't know why, but there was a nail hanging down on the nail head and it literally pierced through my skull as I'm jumping on the nail head in. And I thought it was water dripping down, but it was, blood and so next thing I know I'm like I have no control I'm out I'm on the floor and then I'm out of my body instantly and which is good news when you have an ND you're usually out of your body which is great because I don't like feeling pain so uh, I'm looking at things I'm looking above the body I'm seeing this being of light maybe kneeling down with hands although they're all light over me and over my head. And I would say they're about, I, they're an angel. I would consider um, maybe 10 feet tall. I mean, they're pretty tall. And so, but they were kneeled down. I could uh, see my cousin get the grown ups and come up and everything. And I could see downstairs. Then I got curious and I could see outside. I could hear the conversations, all of them at once. I could see us. I mean, your senses are incredibly heightened. And then I was told that I had to go and go back in. And then I went back in and it hurt <laughs> badly. And I was confused and dazed and all that. And so um, basically my grandparents, my mom, you know, she didn't know she was a young mom was there. So my grandparents showed up, took me to an intern and they said I had a contusion and to just watch over me. But I literally had a hole in my head two years. That opened me up from that point on seeing spirit people in my bedroom at night at three years old and own my whole life. Except for now, they know I don't allow that. <laughs> like, please go away unless it's important. Um, but I would always see spirit people. It was very confusing because I knew there were people, but they were spirit. Most of them were lost souls um, that haven't crossed over. They have unresolved issues. And the, and I didn't really know how to be a counselor to them at that point in time. And so, um, and you know, a lot of times it just takes a gentle push and then they're on their way. 
but at the time i don't know what that was and then i would also see darker things in the wall like humanoid black figures it looked like a tadpole 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 tail and um humanoid but then like claws and then it had a row of teeth like looked like sharp teeth and red eyes they were demons and they were trying they were crawling the walls it was awful and i would see that they would come occasionally and they were just trying to intimidate me from not doing this work and it didn't work so there you go and but they weren't allowed to touch me i suppose because they never <laughs> never did i was always protected but it did show me i was able to see into other realities and i think that was really helpful and so at four, I was in a car crash. Um, how that happened was my mom, it, she was in Hickory, North Carolina, and is with the foothills of the mountain. And there probably wasn't a lot going on in terms of, of choices. In <laughs> so this guy was, she was really interested in, was flashy, that was working at the radio station. And she, he, he, well, he dressed, you know, really cool and all that. So she just had to have him and she wanted me to meet him because she had me divorced, you know, from the first one and they were just too young. And so here now she's, she's a little bit older. I'm, you know, four years old. She wants me to meet him. And the day that she picked, I mean, I don't know. She's so, my mom's hard headed. Um, anyway, she wanted to meet <laughs> this guy. It was like snowy and, and, uh, bad weather. We have a thing here called black ice. Like you don't want to like, it's just dangerous. You don't want to be out with that. So my grandmother was like, please don't go today of all days. But she wanted to go because he had a day off. So she says, we're just going to go down the road and get something to eat because everything's pretty close. So he picked us up and we walked down. We had to walk. She had this old Victorian house. We'd walk down the stairs from the back and then we go eat at the Pizza Hut. I remember that Pizza Hut. Uh, and um, like those old Pizza Huts that had the vaulted ceilings. And then we, um, Got some ice cream at Baskin Robbins afterwards, which that seemed weird when it was so cold. But anyway, I guess he was trying to win me over with ice cream. And so then we went over to his radio station and they got into, I looked at albums and they went and talked. And then they came back about an hour later, an hour and 15 minutes. They were arguing and she wanted to get married. He wanted to wait till he had more money. So we left. And when we, we did, he sped out of there. Okay, remember the black eyes. <laughs> so the car spun around. He hit the brakes, and I was in the front seat and not wearing a child safety belt. I mean, this is before you had to do that. And so it it spun around and it hit a tree, and I went through the windshield. It hit. It got crammed in on the left side, and as soon as the impact, as soon as we had impact, lights out. So, which is really good news. So people that go through these things that it's accidents, it's so quick, you're, you're, you're propelled out. So I didn't feel that pain. I didn't know I feel that impact. I just, I was out and I was in this place that was all black and it was uh, confusing because I didn't know where my hands or feet are, but I was just as conscious as I am right now. I mean, totally just like, Hey, you know, so personality still and everything. And, uh, I, I didn't really understand. And so I saw this pin a whole light and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I saw it was Jesus coming toward me. My grandmother told me Jesus was our friend and, and that said he was, he would look out for us. So I knew that much. That's about what I knew. And she she's right on that. <laughs> so he started coming forward and he it looked like he was, um, you know, in a rock video where the wind's blowing, his hair was blowing back and he's coming kind of gliding toward and his hands. And he did have the marks in his hands at this point. So he had the marks in the hands. I don't know why, maybe so I can identify who he is. I don't, I don't really know. And then he had people behind him, which I, I had never met in this life, but yet I somehow knew they were my family or related. And then he told me, you know, mind to mind telepathy that I had to go back. And then at that point, it felt like home, like some kind of part of me, like this is my, our natural state. And I was like, I don't know. As soon as he said, we have to go back, um, I was back and with all the pain and my notes was shattered. Um, my mom gets me, uh, pulls me because it was a big windshield and I went up and there, she had to 
pull me out, wedge me out. And when she's holding me, I'm like outside of my body and I'm seeing a rip in the universe, kind of rip in the sky. It looked like, uh, I call it a God portal because it was not scary, but it was like flames and fire. It was like creation. The only thing that I've seen close to that is David Ditchfield, uh, who I've had on my Seeking Heaven channel, who's a wonderful person um, that's became an artist and a musician after, after um, uh, this, you should have him on. He's good. Uh, speaker very uh, genuine but uh, he painted that and that's what I saw and then I saw my angel which I was told it was Uriel I didn't know many years later you know that was like an arch archangel I didn't know that and and so afterwards I, well I'm still here I'm still hovering around my body semi-unconscious I'm looking to the left I'm seeing all these spirit people in different period outfits and then behind that I'm seeing a fire station again it's closed it's winter there's nobody in the street it's bad weather and so it's closed but i'm seeing these spirit firemen and these old-timey firemen outfits and they were just there honestly out of love and concern and then a woman stuck her head no one could see it but me a woman stuck her head in the uh the pat the um driver's side and she had a pillbox hat on and she announced herself as judith hefner I'm going to write, this is all being written in my book, Love from Heaven. But anyway, and she said, my grandmother went to her mother's jewelry store and bought jewelry. And then she said, it was nice to meet me. And then there were people in the back seat too, that were family. One of them was called Catherine to kind of find out. I never knew it till much later in life that my grandmother had a sister that died. I, I did not know that. I didn't know that till later. Someone told me in the family, but her name was Catherine people in the back seat and they just kind of gathered there for me and then i heard whisper saying she's the one who carries our voice she's the one who carries our voice and didn't really think much of it at the time but anyhow i had a shattered face we 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 went back to the the uh, radio station and at that point they mom left with him and kind of just she left her her parents on my grandparents, which were pet taking care of us. And we moved in, in a trailer, which was horrible. And that's when the sexual abuse started. Um, that was four. And it was, people don't understand that when it's a pedophile, which I absolutely detest, um, it's a sickness. It's a demonic spirit. Um, that it, it creeps in with people. It can creep in through family lines. It can be cut and can be gotten rid of, but um, it's creepy how they talk to you and, and, and you're a child and you're innocent. And I think that's the, the attraction to, to perverts, you know? And so we're in the trailer. I'm left alone. Um, I do end up ha having a vision, uh, <laughs> little helpers. There was a little commercial on called, uh, at the time, uh, Valley Dale sausage. I mean, you're from At Atlanta, Tia. Do you remember Val you know, Valley Dale sausage? Well, I was born and raised in Michigan, so I'm not, I don't remember that sausage. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe we're talking about near-death experiences and sausages, but uh, <laughs> what, who cares, you know, anyway, but it was the commercial is, you know, it was back then. I remember because we had a black and white TV and I hated it because we had color at my grandparents, but anyway, because they had money and, and, you know, and now we're in a trailer or a park. Uh, which I guess in the UK, they called a caravan. It was, it was quite awful. And uh, we just ate hot dogs all the time. It was terrible. Not whole meals, but uh, th there was a commercial called Valley Dale Sa Sausage and these little pigs and little cartoon animals. Valley Dale Sausage. Ooh, 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 ooh. Valley Dale. Hooray for Valley Dale. Hooray for Valley Dale. And I thought in my mind, because I had imagination, they were my friends. So when I would lay in bed at night, I would visualize them carrying me and taking me out of the place so, um, I had never used a phone. I didn't know my grandmother or, or granddaddy's phone number, but they gave it to me and I dialed it and they were shocked. They said, where are you? And I gave them street by street <laughs> directions at four years old, which is crazy. Uh, 20 minutes away. The family always wondered, how did you know that? Well, spirit showed me, which I think is really freaking cool, but they use little animated figures. So it wouldn't seem so, you know, so it'd be more playful to me. And they showed up and they, you know, tried to get me out and all of that. But at the sexual abuse, uh, my mom ended up marrying the guy. He ended up adopting me. And so 
we move to Raleigh, North Carolina, and this is where the big NDE is. When I was five years old, um, we, we were moved to Cary, North Carolina, which is Raleigh, and that is a um, beautiful um, place. Uh, really been developing but when at the time we were it was still somewhat new and we were in new apartments there and my mom was taking jobs as a kelly girl it was a temp person you know like a secretarial and so she he was in radio at wkix there and he was uh was he i don't know if he's a dj or in sales because he's done dj on sales he ended up doing being in sales the actually the top sales person in all the southeast he did do well with that but while she was gone, uh, he would, the molestation started and I would hide in the closet. I would hide under the bed. He would say he loved me. It was really creepy stuff. Okay. It's a wonder I'm not, I'm not <laughs> a twisted or weird person, but I think it's through the grace of God and my connection to Christ that has purified me and purified my heart. Um, in as many years of forgiveness and, uh, I was angry at first, you know, when I, as I got older, and realized what happened and that went on for a while. And then, uh, I think the love of my husband really helped with that. But when I was five, um, this, the abuse got so bad. And I remember at one point I had strep throat and I kept getting strep throat. And I think it was my body's reaction to the abuse, if you know what I mean. And so I, um, told God I didn't want to live. And I said, I just, you know, I, I said, I can't, I didn't say it. Like I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't know what this is, but I don't like it. And I needed to stop. And I said, can you kill him? Well, see, I didn't know that was bad because I'm five years old. So then I kind of got this frown. So I was like, well, okay, we'll just take me. And that's what happened. So I had pneumonia. I had a, I had a fever, um, uh, they kept getting higher over two to three days. I think it was really two days. By the third day, it was bad. So two days. And so now my fever is up to 103.9. And so I'll take you to the third day that it became really bad. And I remember what was on TV. It was Carol Burnett. I'm laying on this fuzzy gold sofa and I'm, you know, laying there. And I remember my body, I had no energy at all. And so my mom, um, she tried to feed me tomato soup and cheese toast. <laughs> I could not eat it. I, I couldn't, uh, to find out later, the reason why is my lungs were shutting down. <laughs> couldn't eat. So, um, she sent, I remember she sent, uh, my stepdad to go get some ice cream to make a, a milkshake just to get that down or whatever. I was lactose intolerant. So that was probably a bad idea too. But anyhow, I couldn't do anything. So she put me to bed. She washed me, put me to bed. And I was drenched within an hour of my fever. And so she called the hospital and they said, put me in a tub of ice, which was awful. Because if you're freezing, you don't want to be in a tub of ice. But she put me in a tub of ice and I was losing consciousness. So they didn't take me to the hospital because he kept saying, we can't afford it, which my grandparents would have paid for that. So that was just, that, that's not really entirely true. But anyway, she demanded, I'm taking her now, get the car. So he had a radio, WKIX, he had a radio uh, media car. So at this point, this is the day Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Okay. So we, we're in the South. So there's riots. Okay. <laughs> Raleigh, it's, it's the capital of North Carolina. It's the riots. And as we're driving the car, no one's out. You have a curfew at 10. It's 11 now. And so, uh, as we're driving, it's nobody on the streets. Just, I mean, you have to have permission. So we go, we go to this, uh, as we're, um, driving, I lose consciousness and I'm above the car and I'm just following the car about 200 feet up in the air. And I'm seeing the riots from the distance and the fires. And then we get to the first stop. There's an MP and he said, MP a little like um, a uh, bucket hat on. And he said, you have to stop. It's a barricade. They barricaded the street and said, why are you here? And he said, Oh, my daughter, he was going through the adoption with me, which no one asked me, but that's what happened and said, um, would, um, this is my daughter. She's very ill. And he goes, um, and at that point I was lifeless. 
and I was just watching above. Then I come in the car and look, my mom was crying because, uh, I, I was, uh, basically, uh, almost dead. Okay. And so they uh, said, Oh, we'll call ahead, whatever. So they did. And I remember the hospital was Rex hospital because uh, T-Rex, you know, I remember that. And so, uh, when we get there, there's, uh, about, um, less than a dozen doctors and nurses run out to get me. They were saying code blue and I'm watching above and I watched them above, take me to this room. They're rushing and they put me, they put something down my throat and they start pumping out all this goop, you know, cause my lungs were filled up with congestion. And so I watched that for a while from different angles and they were very concerned. There were two male doctors working on me and then a lot of nurses and, um, my mom and stepdad were outside and she was upset. She was cussing him because she, we should have taken her earlier. And then I'm zooming around the hospital. I kind of get bored with that. So I'm zooming around different rooms, looking at what's going on, see if I can be of assistance to people as like a little angel <laughs> and you know like a go in rooms like one lady's having a baby and she's she's afraid that she's gonna lose it and I said and I said your child needs you and I was like wow this is great being an angel and then I stopped at a vending machine as spirit and some little girl saw me in a brownie she had a brownie outfit on and she saw me anyhow um then I went back and checked on that so finally um they said for two hours, they worked on me and I would keep flatlining. So I was dead on all two hours. And then this is the part that really sucks. I don't know why it's, it's, I don't know why it bothers me. Most of it doesn't because I was more like an observer of things and I felt a little, some con slight concern, but not as much as you'd think. But when they covered me up with the white sheet and I remember the nurse is crying and the doctor says, I have a daughter her age. That sounded pretty final. So, um, then I saw in sp a spirit them leave and say something and they said about like paperwork. And then, uh, then I saw in spirit, uh, it, they were Catholic. I knew even though we weren't, but I could tell, um, they were Catholic. It was a male and a female, uh, a nun and a priest. And she, uh, and they look like old timey kind of outfits and she was holding, uh, a, like uh, the flying nun outfit. She was holding a rosary and she said, blessed are the innocent. Well, she's talking about me. I didn't know that later on, many years later, I found out that you used to be Rex hospital. The original hospital used to be a Catholic hospital. Anyhow, in that instant, I'm looking down and there's, I'm in a different place and there's this beautiful meadow and there's a man kneeled down and he's holding my hand and he was smiling. He has the most beautiful smile and beautiful teeth, beautiful eyes. His eyes just, they're not normal. They're just like, just they're living, uh, like they're moving like blue and green. They're just amazing. But it was Jesus. And, and <laughs> I said, you're, you're that man I talk to, you know, when I am, you know, my prayers and whatever. And he goes, I am. And he was smiling and there were, the, it was a pasture. It was really pretty and green. It was like the perfect park. And then to the left, there were children playing and like a roundabout. And he said, you have to go back. And I said, I didn't want to, because those kids were here and there's, and I should stay. And I did have a body, but it, it just, everyone had bodies there, but they obviously weren't the same as the flesh, but they look like replicas. And, uh, he said that he had something to give me and, um, I'm a kid, you know, I'm five. So I, I said a toy. He thought that was really funny. And he says, no. And then he took a part of his belt. Um, he took, he had like, um, uh, like a, just a plain old rope out and he took a part of it, wrapped it in my left wrist. And he said, I wrap you in my love, protection, and wisdom, much is given, much you'll give through the small things. The big things will be accomplished and through the big things, the small things will be done. So, um, I, I really begged to stay there. I really begged to stay. He said, my mom needs me. Uh, she said, he told me, he said, you've got more love in you than she has for herself. She needs you. I said, oh, she'll be fine. <laughs> to my mom later she said great which I, I actually came up this whole incident with her about 
five years ago. And she's like, how do you remember? Cause they didn't want to tell me all this happened. Maybe, you know, they're a neglect, they're ashamed of it, or they didn't want me to remember, but she was kind of surprised. I said, it, I said, it all worked out. Don't worry about it. But I did. I said, she'll be fine. And he goes, no, she won't be fine. You have to, you have to be with her. And he said, but you can stay a while. So we walked around and as we walked, uh, he had really nice feet, by the way, it, his feet looked like they were pedicured or something, but as he's walking the grass was curling around his, his feet and every flower and every leaf was following him and almost whispering like an admiration and love and the clouds. And I'm was thinking, does he know all these things are following him? <laughs> And then he said, I could ask him anything. We walked over to a, a tree, which I believe now is the tree of life. And we sat at a rock. It was like the dividing point. I couldn't go past that. And he, it was a big rock. I kind of, he kind of sat on it and I kind of cradled beside of him. And he said, I could, by telepathy, mind of mind, I could ask him anything. And I asked him a stupid things because I was a kid. I didn't know like electricity, how it works. Boom. I instantly knew. Um, I just asked him, you know, a couple of simple things. I really didn't know what to ask. I was just more concerned about, uh, I just kept complaining that, <laughs> that I, I didn't want to go back. I didn't like this world that, uh, I didn't understand why I was here. And so he began teaching me and he said he wanted to teach me about creation. And he said, we create here with our mind and heaven is very quick. It's done quickly. On earth, it takes longer. So you have to be mindful of what you say to manifest that. And you have to keep these positive thoughts, keep that in so you can manifest what you truly want and desire. And he's, and I said, so you said it's quick here. Like how quick can I try it? And he goes, sure. So I visualized we were in this little boat on a river and we were, and these three fish came up to him and he picked one up and and he just said hello or something. He put it, it was very funny. And then he put it back in and he goes, that's how we fish here. And then next thing, you know, we're back in that, um, that pasture. And so he did, he did say that I have to go back. I didn't want to, but he said that I need to show my mom love and what that, um, and I said, I don't know how to do that. He goes, there's no right or wrong way of doing it. He said, but you'll know what to do. So, um, he said, but I'll always be with you. And, and so I felt really blessed. He did say, I will send you one person. I did the time. I did not understand who that was, but now I know I met my husband at 19 and he's like an angel. I mean, he's just so good. He feeds me. He looks after me. He, he makes sure I'm calm. He, if there's any strange people, he kind of keeps them away from me. <laughs> he's just been my protector. So, um, and he's so supportive in anything, any, as I've evolved and every aspect of me from my ad agency to, um, it, you know, it, every endeavor, we did martial arts together. We, we both are black belts and, and hop keto. We, we used to be in the swing dance team. We've always, he's always just been a partner and, uh, and he's made this world fun and bearable. And Jesus did not leave me alone here. He gave me a support system and, uh, and was able that helped me to heal because of his gentleness. So, um, you know, I was able to come back, but when I came back, I did not go in my body. I kind of cheated. So I did the angel thing again in the hospital, helping people. And then a man showed up, he gets a little girl. And I felt like he was the hospital administrator at one point, maybe in the forties, his name was Dr. Dr. Tippin, T-I-P-P-I-M. And he said, you have to go back. And I said, no. And then Jesus showed up, he pulled rank and he goes, I've made it. Okay. And soon as he said that I woke up in this plastic tent and I saw my relatives there and so forth, but that opened me up to all sense of higher levels. I was able to have full conversation with spirit people with ascended masters. Them. I've left that communication up with Jesus has not stopped. And since then, so I'm very grateful for it. Um, I don't, I look at what I got out. And then I had many surgeries later, like three surgeries later to get the cartilage out of my, out of my nose. I've had sinus issues and they've had to pull all that out, but God's good. Cause my, I, my face is fine. I mean, after all that, 
And then just quickly on the others, but the, the five-year-old with Jesus, I just cherished that. The one where I was, I was, oh, they clocked me in at 15 minutes dead on arrival and then another two hours dead on and off. So, and then Jesus resurrected me. He resurrected me fully. My, I mean, from the nail in my head from early on to now, um, I should not be, you know, I should have brain damage, but I don't, I'm very sharp and, and on it and have a, a, a extra gifts. And then when I was 10 years old, um, my family's going to Myrtle beach for a family vacation. And we were there and my sister was like three or four and she was in the baby pool with my mom. And I was in the big pool and there were kids in there and I was swimming and I was swimming underneath the pool. And I got caught up with boys playing volleyball and their legs. They didn't know I was down there. And it was a very busy pool. And, and so I started, um, taking in water and then I saw the water start, um, separating as light, like a horizon in there. And I heard a chamber of angels. A choir was like, oh, like you would imagine like layers of layers of angels go, oh. you know, all that layered and layered. And I was like, oh crap, not again. And the next thing you know, I, I don't remember anything else except for, um, uh, a, a lifeguard is getting water out of my mouth, you know, kind of, and I'm coughing it up. And my mom shows it like, what happened now? So, so it wasn't really safe to talk about these things with my family till I got older. And then when I was 38, I had a reaction to a, it was for menstrual migraines, a pill from a medical doctor. And I had a reaction and I took, uh, I think it was like three, not, you know, like, a you're supposed to take it at night or sleep to help with that. And so I think it was my fourth time and I woke up like bells or alarms went off and I couldn't, I don't know why my motor skills, I could not talk to my husband. I couldn't, I don't know why I couldn't like get it going. I couldn't, I couldn't talk. I couldn't even, I couldn't think straight. I was shutting down. So I just kind of like a corpse, you know, like Frankenstein. I got out of the bed. I went where the TV was and turned it on. And I thought, well, if I can just watch the TV and hear consciousness and I'll be okay if I can follow something. But what happened was I started hearing that white uh, noise and I was like, oh boy. So I, I know what comes with that is fear and then immediate, I don't care. And that's pretty much so what happened. I saw my furniture in the living room start to turn into white lines everywhere. And I, <laughs> I saw the holographic universe. Um, later on, I find out that's a stage at the Monroe Institute, the white lines. I didn't even know about that, but they were white. Everything was white lines constructed. And then I was in the galaxy and I was, I, I like the, the Milky Way. I like where our planets are, where the, uh, Andromeda and there's Cirrus. I love going out there. Uh, it's so pretty. And that's where I was. And then I realized I didn't have an, I don't remember if I was male or female. I had a name. I was just pretty at ease with everything, but yet I was also bilocational in the body. So I took one finger and I pointed it in my leg just to kind of get me back. And this went on maybe three hours. I eventually got myself because I thought, okay, I haven't, you know, it's only one pill, you know, I can do this. And I forced myself kind of back in by touching my body, come back, come back. And finally I did, I drank a lot of water. And so all these different layers of my near-death experiences has made me realize that we are in an agreed upon construct that we are connected to the divine and that, um, spirit people are very close to us. They're very, they're not that far off and, and, in, in the realm, they do check on us. They care. Um, as soon as you think of someone, they're right there. Um, there is no separation with that. And, and life is, is eternal. And everything we do here, we're accountable for, and it matters. So, you know, I, there, I think there was a book about conversations with God. It said, nothing matters. Well, I disagree. Everything matters. Everything we do here matters. Every smile, every kind word gives a ripple effect. Everything matters. What I do matters. What you do matters. What everybody else matters. That's why it's so important when you feel called, you know, like to have your channel. And for me, to have my seeking heaven show it's important because we need to have people out there with multiple voices speaking this message of love and hope and 
and to let them know there's something bigger here and we are connected to to a god and uh and if we want to seek it out, there's something pure within us that we can connect to that divine source. So, um, you know, I have a lot of after effects, I'm an, you know, evidential medium. I have full conversations. I mean, they will talk to me <laughs> my gosh, spirit people. I love them. They're so funny because they're at a higher state. So they're just like, so honest and funny. A lot of them. And uh, I also talked to at the higher realms, the center master. I didn't really plan that. It just sort of happened. And I think that when you open your heart up for these things and and come from a place of love and not fear and, 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 you know, set your boundaries, of course, you know, stay away, anything weird, you know, put your boundaries that you're just going to find that match vibration of that. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't believe in doing things that are strange, but I do believe in ascending your consciousness to higher levels and not being fearful of that because we're an eternal spiritual being. And, and I think that people put a lot of limitations on themselves. So that's my favorite saying that we are eternal spiritual beings word for word. I love that. Um, and you actually walk the walk. You don't just talk the talk in the short time that I've spent with you. I've seen just what a caring and loving individual you are. Um, and so thank you just for being you, you and for doing the work that you do and sharing this amazing experience. Well, your whole life like has been an amazing experience, but the near death experiences have been extremely uplifting and encouraging and loving. And that's very important. So it means a lot to me that you're share. Oh, you're so welcome. Well, I mean, I'm an open book. Is there any questions that you've got uh, with that? I mean, I know this a lot, what I said. And the the big question I know I get from a lot of people is why so many near-death experiences? Well, you know, what what does it matter? You know, why do you have so many kids? Why do you have no kids? Why do you, why have you so many, why do you have so many divorces? Why do you, does it really matter in the end? The fact is, I think I took the fast track. You know, I wanted, it did open me up to superior gifts. I am an international psychic medium. I've done readings and radio shows in the UK and USA, all over uh, South Africa. I have gifts now to heal people and to help. So, um, you know, it all worked out. So I, I just look at it like it's a blessing. I mean, it may be more compassionate to people, especially people that have come from abuse um, I can sense that in them and I understand. And so, um, unfortunately in this world, we have to see suffering. We have to experience it in order to really, truly appreciate the sweet nectar of what life is and the life that's been given to us is so precious and we don't want to squander it. We want to be able to, you know, if we have that gut feeling our next move, we need to take it. We need to pray on it, meditate. And then if it's, if we're getting, yes, just have a leap of faith and do that. And that's how I've done every step of the way, which has, um, which I guess somewhat leads <laughs> to, we're going to be talking about the, the galactic stuff and star seed, but I did not have that on the plate at all. Um, that was something that came up when, um, uh, we were talking, pre-show that you were called by God to start this. And I think it's awesome. You should follow it and you're going to do great. But same with me. It was four years ago, July with the seeking heaven channel. And I started with seeking heaven, the near to the experience of the phenomena. It, it started with near to the experiences. And I still love that. I still love meeting and talking to people about that because it shows consciousness goes on. But then the star seeds stuff started coming up and it started evolving in my memories and, uh, that connection. And that's a whole different thing. So, um, then when I would talk to other near the experiences, they would talk about their star seed and other planetary experiences they remember. So, um, I think it does open you up to higher levels and it never really stops. You don't have to have a near death experience for that to happen, but just knowing that your consciousness can go on and on and there's no limitations should be um empowering to people um to know that that you're protected but your consciousness goes on and i just don't believe in trapping ourselves in to religious dogma or family dogma 
or or family, you know, things we learn, practices. I think we need to decide for ourselves what our soul needs. And I think that a lot of people are doing that these days. I think they are. I think the planet's changing. Um, and do you think that you had these experiences? I know you talked about, you know, it doesn't matter why, but maybe you had planned it pre-birth or before you came here, this was part of your mission. So you were going to have a traumatic life because you don't grow through easy, you know, just smooth sailing. You grow through trauma, you grow through pain. Um, do you think that's why you experienced it all? Yeah, I do. I mean, we look at if we want to be like, say, for example, I mean, I hate to say this, people don't like this, but we want to be Christ-like. He did suffer a lot and he was basically not accepted. And the people that loved him, many of them turned against him. So what does that mean? We have to be vulnerable enough to be able to learn the lessons and to go through some kind of tragedy or suffering to understand the differences, to understand that that um, lesson, uh, what that is. For me, you know, even like the sexual abuse, do I want that? No, I think what happens, you agree to certain things. You don't agree getting the cancer, getting, having an accident. You don't agree to that. You just agree that I'm going to be in these so-and-so and there's going to be uh, some challenges. And, but afterwards here, you know, here's the perk. <laughs> it kind of entice you. Here's the perk. You know, you get all these special gifts. So you don't know how the form is going to come. Um, but uh, I think that taught me compassion. And at the end, I felt sorry for him. I mean, he was a ghost for four years. He was like harassing my sister and mom and me. And I had to say, look, no, if you're not, you can't do that. He tried to do that to me. I was like, no, as a ghost. I was like, I had it in life. We're not doing this. And so I asked Jesus to step in and then asked my grandmother to like, who's very strong enough to like block him from coming around and till he crosses him. <laughs> and, uh, he, he shut, my grandmother showed up at a couple where he said, yeah, she's stopping this guy. He's just like keeping him in a cave till he, till he starts to behave. Yeah. Cause you have, you can still choose God in these States, but you, but if you, some people just want to hang on cause they are afraid of being judged or, uh, they're just belligerent. And so they hang around a while. And then, you know, if they hang around too much with an attitude, they will inherit a demonic entity. Um, so you want to cross people over quick. you want to let them know it's okay. They're loved I always bring in Christ and the angels and Michael to help them cross over. But, um, that's the kindest thing that you can do, especially if you notice that, um, to help them go on to a, a life that's happy with family members there. And then, then they're going to most likely pick up another life. And we do go in packs of people. We, but we don't have to, we can change that agreement if we want to. Uh, we do. That's why people seem familiar to us. Cause we, we played game. We played the game of life with them before. Um, what do you think happens when we die? You went over there, but you had to come back. What happens when we're there permanently? Um, okay. So this is my thoughts on that. So when we go to like, for me, I was a child, I go to the heavenly realms. The reason for that, I think a lot of children do is they're innocent in the heavenly realms. I was told there's, look, I don't have evidence of this, but I've been told there are 12 heavenly realms. Um, and within that there's healing and there's just an abundant amount of love. You do have to have, and some kind of, um, uh, avatar celestial body. I mean, you got to have, it kind of looks like this, but it's, uh, made up of a different material. Like I could swim, like while we were there, he took me around, we went to a, a like a lake and I was able to swim in this little lake or stream and breathe. And like, we can't do that here, but you could do that there. Um, I, I needed healing. And so if I had stayed there, I might've decided to stay as a kid for a while. Sometimes people that go there when they die as a child or baby, I get it a lot with, with my, uh, evidential medium readings. They grow up on the other side. Cause I'll get evidence that, uh, blah, 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 you know, Robert senior. I go, Oh, that's my granddaddy. That's my daddy. Okay. So your son is with them and playing basketball. <laughs> they do things there. They really do things there. I mean, have, like heaven on earth, they don't have like garbage cans and all that 
stuff, your rot, nothing decays, but they do things there. Like they have farms, they, they grow vegetables. I mean, it's, they like to do things. Um, and so, um, they will grow up with the family members till they're about, you know, right around anywhere from however they like to, their body to end off looking 24. Some people like older, like 30, 34, you know, they like a more mature look, what that, when they look like then they'll grow to that point and they may stay there for a while. Then after they've done, gotten some healing, then they go on to a thing. It's a reincarnation cycle that we're going to get weird. There is a reincarnation cycle on, um, with the Octurians and the people, <laughs> they go there, other end of years have seen it, but they go there and he, afterwards they decide, and there's a council of light and they decide with your angels and your guides, your council, but the council of light, which is uh, the part of the divine order, um, at the highest level, they decide, and I've seen them, they look like little beings of our eyes can't register it, but in my mind, there's little beams of bright light and they decide, they help you decide what your next journey is. And you pick out your life. And if you're going to be male or female, are you going to be an astronaut or what are you going to be? Are you going to be on this planet? Another planet, generally you come back to this planet. Um, but that's changing because of this new earth. And a lot of people are opting out. This is the first time in like, since we've been here on earth that we can opt out <laughs> if we ascend. So that's why I encourage people to ascend, handle their shadow work, um, come from a love vibration, handle anything, you know, re repent, purge, get rid of anything you don't need emotionally, fill your heart with love. If you can't, if you don't know how, ask Christ, fill your heart with love because we're ready to ascend so people don't have to keep coming back to earth they can go to a higher level planetary vibration some want to stay here and help create the new earth out of this turmoil some are going to be new earth leaders um they're gonna it's going to be you're going to have to go through some poop before doing that so only the strong are, are, are going to be doing that but some decided they're going to do that but you do go through a reincarnation life is um vibrant and eternal so it does is everlasting, just like the flowers come every year and they, they, or they pollinate in the other areas. We too, that life goes on. We are part of God. I do not believe we are God. If we were God, if I was God right now, I'd fix everything. <laughs> I would be like, you know, no, no problems anywhere. Uh, healing, free food, everything great. You know, I would handle that, but we are uh, a part of God that we are uh, a spark of God that we are creating, uh, and as a, hopefully a reflection of God, uh, and manifesting it in this world in our own unique, special little way. So life goes on. It, it, you can't help it. We are constantly going and, uh, consciousness continues. So, uh, and we do things with, it, and we become different characters. And I think it's, it's really cool and exciting because it goes on. And if we choose to be with people or we choose to be different for different experiences, we can, we can do that. So everything that we learn spiritually here, we take with us all the stuff we've had stuff that doesn't really matter. But what we take is everything that we learn here that develops and furthers our soul. We have a lot to talk about still, and, um, we're going to be having a part two actually, so do you have anything to leave the viewers with for part one about your near-death experiences and uh, the gifts that you were given and the lessons that you learned? Oh, that's great. Yes, that's the title of my book. So I'm um, working on my book, finishing that. I know people say, Tamara, when are you going to have that? I am kind of busy with my Seeking Heaven channel. So I want to leave that with people. Please uh, subscribe to my Seeking Heaven channel and subscribe to Tia's channel, okay? And then I'm going to have you on my channel as well. I also have um, academyofdivinewisdom.com. And if you sign up there, there are free, some free classes, paid classes online. I was told again to start that. And I really picked and fought for about 12 years, but it's, it's, it's doing great. I've started a year and a half ago. It's really beautiful. So it's called academyofdivinewisdom.com. And then if people want a uh, evidential life path reading that's, you know, God-based and beautiful and sacred. They can go to southernbellmedium.com 
and they can see where to buy a reading session. And then I will be on this galactic cruise, uh, galacticorigincruise.com. I think that's it. And that will be February. No, excuse me. Pardon me. That's December of 2024. And so a lot of that, I just signed the contract and excited about being a keynote speaker. But if you go there, I'm just going to mention and mention free 30 That's F R E E. And then 30 you get, uh, just by using my, my, free 30 in my name when signing up, I can give everyone that link. But when you sign up, you will get a free 30 minute, $325 um, a reading from me, which is good for every person that's in, and that goes on the ship. I'll be speaking at least a couple of times there, maybe doing a medium demonstration and some channeling. So um, if you want to connect with me in person and have a fun time and get to wear some really fun cool mermaid outfits and stuff. Join me. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Is that something that you do regularly or is this a one-time thing? The cruise? Um, they're start, you know, that's cool that you mentioned it. Yeah. Well, uh, I've done a lot of talks. People have seen me and again, I'll, I'll talk more about it in part two and about, cause you, I think you'll be interested in that, but, um, but I've done a lot of talks for portal to Ascension. You can see their website. It's very good. They're, they're really into the star sea thing. Very, I would say they're the leader, one of the leader, I would say in it. And uh, Neil Gar, who started it 16 years ago, um, I connected with him through uh, Joan of Angels. And then I started doing talks on their own at Atlantis and the Essenes um, and my actually past life memories with that associated with each one and then astral travel. And then on the ship, I'm doing one called at sea with Sirius B. We talk about mermaids and, and the life there and living um, as a shapeshifter aqua Aryan that, that we didn't call them mermaids. They were called aqua Aryans. And so, uh, uh, or you can call them aquatics, but myrrh was like, you know, that, no, we didn't call it that. So um, then I'll be teaching light language too. So uh, if you want to learn light language, I'll be showing you how to do that. So yeah, this has evolved and it's, it's, uh, it's all good. It's all okay. And it's exciting that there's so much more to us that we had no idea about. Very good. But yeah. They just, they just started this cruise by the way. And it's like, yeah, so there should be many more of them, but this is the beginning of them. I think that sounds fun, right? Going to a fun oh, yeah. workshop and then dressing up and having parties and hanging out and laughing and going to these things. And some of, I want to make mine fun and interactive. Yeah, for sure. That does sound like a lot of fun. I'm going to check it out. Well, thank you for being here with me today, Tamara. I'm really appreciative of you sharing your story and I look forward to part two. Oh, me too. Thank you so much for having me, Tia. I'm just so excited about what you're doing and that I know you now. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.